here we see one of uh, Sir Isaac Newton's great discoveries, namely that the uh, force that makes ordinary objects fall to the ground, like apples and rocks and such, is actually the very same force that keeps the uh, celestial objects in their orbits, like uh, the moon and pl the planets and such. It's th the same thing, same force of nature controlling both of these phenomena. How did Newton know uh, this? For that matter, how does any of us know us to know this today, which we are asked to believe by our school textbooks? Well, uh, Newton had an excellent argument for it. And let's consider uh, how he figured this stuff out. Well, he sets up this following thought experiments. He says, suppose that the moon be deprived of all motion and dropped so as to descend toward the Earth. This is how he begins his investigation of this problem. So you are imagining that the moon, instead of having its speed around in its orbit, you, you imagine that you could just hold it still. And then it would start falling toward the Earth because of its weight. But uh, how far would it get in one second? That's what we want to know. That's the, what the question mark represents here. So if we knew that, then we could start comparing it. Uh, how far does the moon get in one second compared to how far does an apple, for example, will fall in one second. And then we could use this for comparison whether they seem to be under influence of the same force or not. So that is our goal. I want to know how far the moon could get in one second. Well, uh, it's not possible to carry out these kinds of experiments, of course. So we have to do a kind of uh, thought experiment in our head, but we can figure it out with the um, power of mathematics, how far, what would in fact happen if the scenario were, played, were to play out. So here is uh, uh, what we do know about the moon's orbit. I have written over here in this gray uh, text the standard parameters of the moon's orbit, like t means the orbital time, the total time it takes for the moon to go all the way around, which is one month, so 27, 28 days, something like this. I translate it into seconds here, and uh, so that's that that's a known value and then s means the distance the total distance all the way around uh, how far the uh, circumference of the moon's orbit which is also known so i entered that value also actually it was you know we have seen how already the the greeks had uh, some ways of approximating this but well in any case th those things are known and using that information I can determine how far the moon is going to go in one second in its orbit, along its orbit, because this you just have to divide the distance per, per time, so you know how far it gets each second. So actually it gets then uh, just over a kilometer, 10,000, I mean 1,022 meters. So that's how far, so we know this green part, and we really want to know the yellow, but at least we know the green, that's the start, you know. Well, and uh, you can think of the the yellow part that we really want to know as a uh, the kind of radial component, so to speak, of the green one. So we have the tangential component in blue here, and we have the radial component in in yellow. So we decompose the this green distance, the the distance that we know, into these into these two pieces. That would be a good start for us to figure this stuff out. Now. In order to determine this, I, this little yellow guy, you remember, that's the one we're looking for, and we know the green. And now I set up a certain triangle uh, situation here, which is going to help us to find the little, uh, the, sm the small yellow side. That's the goal. So uh, these two triangles are similar, I claim, the yellow and the red triangles in this scenario. In order to see this, uh, you will recall Thales theorem, which we have discussed previously, which ensures that the uh, this angle here in the red uh, triangle is going to be a right angle up there because I use the diameter of the orbit as one of the sides. So that ensures that we have a right angle and by construction you also have a right angle here in the uh, in the red, uh, I mean in the yellow triangle because that was the one, remember how we decomposed the green into these perpendicular pieces, the tangential one in the red. So that's why you have a, a right angle over there Furthermore, obviously, the uh, red and the yellow triangles have one angle in common, the angle at the moon. So that ensures that they are in fact similar triangles. They all their angles must be the same now because two are the same. So they're similar triangles. And then I can uh, use that to set up a ratio of sides of, as we often do, you know, that's what similar triangles are for. And I have set it up in this way here where the little yellow, the one we're looking for, is the one on the top left here. And the other guys are you know, you can 
see which side they correspond to by the orientation here. I made it the same orientation as in the original. So that's nice. But in fact, two of these uh, sides that I used to in, in this ratio setup are the ones that are uh, basically approximate the green curve. So if you look at the top of the figure next to the moon, you see that there are two, the, the, the yellow and the red uh, pieces there are uh, pretty much equal to the, the green uh, curve, although they are straight. But since we are talking about a one second time interval, the the amount that the, the moon is curving during that uh, one second is going to be very small. So therefore we can uh, say that those straight lines that uh, are so close to the green line, they're basically equal to the green line. So that's what I fill in here in this uh, ratio, which is good because I know the green though. And uh, furthermore, this big red one, that is uh, just the diameter of the moon's orbit, which is also known. The size of the moon's orbit is known. So I can fill in these numbers for the green segment that I knew and the, the diameter. So everything is just numbers now, except the, uh, the one piece that I was looking for, which is the little yellow one. So I can just compute it from these numbers. And here you go. This is how far it is. Uh, 0 0.00136 meter. So that's uh, about a millimeter that it, it uh, deviates. And that. So that is how far the moon travels in one second directed inwards, the radial motion at so, so little. You know, it really makes you think about the, the uh, celestial dimensions. So in one second then, the moon goes one kilometer straight ahead, which is really far. And it goes only like a millimeter to the left. So this tells you something about the size of the moon's orbit, you know. One kilometer ahead, a millimeter left. One kilometer ahead, a millimeter left. If you keep going like that, it's going to take a long time before you have circled all the way back around, you know. But that's how the moon's orbit works. Anyway, uh, that was not what we were trying to say. We were trying to compare to an apple. That was our goal. Okay, let's see. How, so I know this part, but now I have to take into account the fact that it's a lot further away because gravity deteriorates as the square of the distance. So if the further away, the weaker gravity. Uh, so here we have then uh, the, the fact that illustrated that the radius of the uh, moon's orbit is about 60 times the radius of the Earth. So that's like this. So therefore, if I put the moon, uh, if I held it here at the surface of the Earth and then dropped it, it would be 60 square times as much uh, as powerful a force of gravity because of the uh, the distance uh, squared is what determines the force of gravity. So therefore, if I dropped it closer to Earth, it wouldn't fall anymore, just this lousy millimeter, but rather almost 5 meters, 4.89. So that's uh, what I, the number I get from this from this calculation. This is how far the moon would fall uh, if I could hold it in my hand, so to speak, and drop it right here at the surface of the Earth. So that's what I need to compare to the apple then. How far does an apple go in one second anyway? That's a standard uh, physics problem that's easy to calculate. We know the gravitational acceleration, 9.8 meters per second square, obviously. So from there, we, it follows uh, these, how you can f easily express uh, velocity and distance fallen. And that would lead to the standard value. Uh, in fact, in one second, it falls 4.9 meters. So we have this scenario. When I did a calculation for the apple, it came out 4.9 meters. I did the thing for the moon, it came out 4.89, almost identical. I didn't cheat. I know I looked up these these numbers, just from, from standard uh, standard numerical information about the moon's orbit and so on. And lo and behold, it's in fact uh, virtually identical numbers that we're dealing with here. And just like Newton says, since both these forces are equal between themselves, they will have one and the same cause. It's just a... Uh, you know, this uh, principle of, of scientific reasoning that if two, th two things uh, exhibit the same properties, they will you attribute the same cause to them. So uh, very uh, remarkable how you could reach uh, so far, uh, reach into the skies and determine what forces are controlling their motions with just uh, no experiments of any kind, just a very basic uh, triangle setups 
and the similarities of triangles is all you need to hold your solar system in the palm of your hand in this fashion. So it's a uh, you know, it's the uh, indication of the piercing genius of uh, the great Sir Isaac. So let us all uh, rejoice at the beauty of this piece of mathematics.